Lee Smith, an upstart rooster. As the most poisonous and feared pen on Broadway, he's been called the Count Dracula of critics. With us on Signature, John Simon. Fascinating. What do you see as the difference between a critic and a reviewer? Well, there are many differences, but essentially I think a critic is someone who writes not just for the pleasant moment, but someone whose criticism will be of interest 10, 20, 50, 100 years later. In other words, a critic is someone who is aware of the history of the art he is reviewing, who has a more philosophical approach to it, who uh, writes better, whose writing will be interesting to readers in time to come, who in short is not just a journalist, but is really a, an artist. And a reviewer? A reviewer is the opposite of that. A reviewer is someone who a newspaper hired because he used to do obituaries for them for 20 years, and he's now been promoted to drama critic or film critic, or else it's some little um, twerp who comes out of somewhere and sells himself because he claims to be clever and with it and bitchy and whatnot, and the editor thinks how charming, and so next thing we have Rex Reed. Dare I ask what you think of television and radio reviewers? Well, they're, I think, a step lower yet, uh, because they're usually hired on the basis of their hairdos, uh, whether they have a truly Brillo pad hairdo or whether they have an interesting crew cut that might be an answer to a Brillo pad hairdo. And it's very little to do with what they think or whether they can think at all. Would you ever consider doing television reviewing? Well, I did do it, but under very special circumstances. It was for educational television, and they gave me something like um, five minutes, I think it was. And in five, or even six, you can do something. In other words, that's the equivalent of a short but sizable written review, whereas the one-minute format is a joke. I mean, you, you can only say a few cute nothings and uh, maybe show a film clip or two, and that's it. And that's not criticism. That's not even reviewing. Your opinion may be borne out. I can remember when television critics started, it was often said they were going to replace you gentlemen print. Yeah. But today, there's not much you know, power in it, is there? Well, it depends. It's hard to say. Without an actual survey, it's very hard to say where the power is. And surveys have recently not been conducted or very sloppily conducted. I think if all the television reviewers like something enormously or hate something enormously, it might make a difference. If just one or two of them do, I don't suppose it does. But the same thing can be said of uh, print reviewers, too, unless they're all very enthusiastic, the single exception being, of course, the New York Times. And even that, only if the first thing critic does it. If the second thing critic for the New York Times raves about something, it doesn't mean very much. What happens to the critic who may become the only one, virtually, who liked or hated something and everyone else is opposed to it. Do you think he's uh, somewhat out of step? There isn't, there's no such thing as, as being in step or out of step because you're not supposed to be in step with the rest of the reviewers. You're not supposed to be a phalanx marching to the conquest of a city. You're supposed to be individuals thinking and writing and some individuals think and write better than others. So there will always be differences. They could be smaller differences or they could, could be antithetical differences, but there'll always be differences. And I think the public, which sometimes is puzzled by why one critic is so much more favorable or so much less favorable about something, forgets that this is not an exact science. This is not a true or false. This is not something that you can test with litmus paper. This is not something that a computer could do just as well or better. This is a very individual, very artistic, very subjective thing. And some critics ultimately are proved to have been closer to the truth, the truth being what the future will think about such and such a movie and such and such a play. And at a given moment, we don't know. But 50 years from now, we do know, because either the movie survives or it doesn't. What do you want me, the reader, to do after one of your reviews? Do you want me to go to the play, not go to the play? Oh, I don't want to force you into any 
action except the act of thinking. I want you to talk back to my review. I want you to read it and say, this sounds very interesting, this might be true, this is something that hasn't occurred to me. I'm not sure that it is so, but it's worth checking out and I want to check it out. Or this strikes me as illogical, uh, ludicrous, um, foolish. I can tell even without seeing the play that this has got to be absurd. I want you to talk back at it and get involved with it. And then if you feel that there's enough there to make you want to see it, maybe see it, not necessarily slavishly march off to see it, nor slavishly say, no, 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 this must be terrible. I mean, even if you agree with what it says, you might sort of say, well, still, there could be something there, and maybe I should check it out. Is it also, you should read other reviews and, and maybe get an idea from reading two or three critics. Is it fair to say that many theater owners and producers truly hate you? Yes, it is fair to say, because most uh, theater owners and producers are businessmen, first, second, and last. And if a bad review, a really bad review, especially a well-written one, especially a witty one, especially a, a devastating one, uh, loses them some customers, as it is bound to lose them a few, they feel uh, threatened by it. And if, on the other hand, a very foolish bad review appears that no one would lend any credence to, then that's not a threat to them. In, so, in fact, they tried to bar you from first-night tickets for a while. Well, yes, once there was such an attempt made, but it only lasted a week or two, and it, it only meant that two or three shows were a bit of a problem, and then they realized their own silliness and... Um, there does up. seem to me a danger there. You once said somewhere that you knew three erstwhile film critics who felt they were fired because they wrote nasty reviews. And after all, theater owners, movie theaters are big advertisers. Well, in the past, in the, in the not so recent past, there were cases of uh, newspapers being even less enlightened than they are today. So that in those medieval days, they would actually, in one or two cases, fire someone who lost them a lot of film, not theatrical film advertising. Uh, I think that happened to Bill Zinzer, perhaps, and maybe to one or two other people. But it, it's, I think, by now... You see, now they play it safe in another way. Uh, the big newspapers would not hire someone who would rock the boat enormously and consistently, so that even if there's an occasional ruckus, they, can, they feel they can weather that. Talk about you for a moment. Your audience may be interested to know you ended up getting a doctorate from Harvard. Yes. Most reviewers don't have your credentials. Well, again, let's not make too much of that. I mean, to, to be a good critic or even reviewer, you have to be intelligent, you have to write well, you have to have taste, you have to be able to think. You don't necessarily get that by getting a PhD. It so happens that I went that route because I was in teaching for a while and for teaching I needed that. Uh, you can go any other route too if you have the inborn talent and um, apply yourself to the job. That's not a sine qua non by any means. But it's not a useless thing to have. I've found that it has served me, stood me in good stead. You, you talk of intelligence and taste, obviously you're a man of both. I hope so. Why in some of your reviews are you so incredibly harsh? Well, because it seems to me that readers tend to be hardened in the bad sense of the word. I mean, there's too, too much verbiage has been thrown at them year in, year out. Uh, in order for words to make an impression on people who have been bombarded by words and who are being bombarded from television, from radio, from newspaper, from every medium there is, you have to make the words very strong. Otherwise, they don't penetrate. Um, and so it's, it's a stylistic device. It is, it is using perhaps a little extra uh, force that in a more relaxed age, in a more gracious age, in a more civilized age, perhaps one could tone it down a little bit. But today I feel this is the only way the words have a chance to get through. Uh, uh, sir, <laughs> talking about grace, I mean, uh, Liza Minnelli you called a beagle. Maggie, uh, Maggie Smith you called an upstart ro rooster. Maureen Stapleton you said her face had no redeeming features whatsoever, and I could go on. Would you call those vicious attacks? Well, vicious. I mean, you know, one man's meat is another man's poison. Uh, 
what I might consider appropriate, somebody else might consider vicious. Um, the point is this, that I do believe the theater or film is a total aesthetic experience. And in a total aesthetic experience, the looks of the performers are a very considerable part. And if the person in question plays a hero or a heroine who has to win us over, the audience over right away, the fact that he or she may have a wonderful character, the fact that he or she may be a sweet, gentle person uh, does not register immediately. But good looks register immediately on the stage or on the screen, and they're a shortcut. They're what the ancient orators used to call captatio benevolentiae, the winning of the audience benevolence. And it's a, it's a quick way to establish that this is someone we want to identify ourselves with, this is someone we want to love, this is someone we feel interested in and involved with. If the person doesn't have that, if the person looks like a, I don't know what. <laughs> a I mean, beagle. Well, all right. But you see, when you take it out of context, when you just say beagle or whatever, then that's crude and, and ugly. But if it's in, embedded in a beautiful sentence, in an elaborate metaphor, in a beautifully flowing paragraph, if it is part of an image that builds up to a climax, that's very different from saying nakedly beagle. Well, well, sir, I, 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 perhaps I spared it. It did get worse. You said, you said her mouth, her face went in three directions, Liza Minnelli. Her yeah. chin disappeared. I mean, it really got pretty vicious. Yeah, Do you well, ever feel I mean, bad about those afterwards, in no, hindsight? I, no, I don't. I, 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 that is how I see her. And again, please remember that if the actress or actor can redeem himself or herself by talent, if the performer is so gifted that you forget about his or her looks, which of course with the very best performers does happen, then I take my hat off to that person. One of the actresses, you, I think you called her a perennial gate cat crasher, she finally dumped a plate of dinner on your, on your head. Yes, yes. Uh, did you feel that was uh, uh, totally out of... Well, I mean, what can I say? It's, uh, it was a sneak attack from, from the side where I couldn't see her coming, whereas my review was up front and out in the open. That's the difference right there. Uh, the person in question is Sylvia Miles, who is much better known for being at all kinds of parties, whether invited or not. And I felt that her acting technique, you see, if I just said she's a gatecrasher, again, out of context, that sounds bad. But in context, I said she's a famous gatecrasher, and her acting is a kind of gatecrashing, too. She bulldozes her way onto the stage without any finesse, any subtlety, any depth, and uh, so that the image made sense. Are you ever affected at all by the fact that you are so disliked in the industry that you cover? Well, again, I mean, it's not for me to say this, but in this particular instance, I'll have to. Uh, I'm not by any means universally disliked. I think I'm widely disliked, but that has to do with the fact that there are so many untalented or mediocre people in this or in any profession, and they don't like to be attacked. On the other hand, among those whom I have generally praised, and not always praised, sometimes even uh, not praised. I think there are a good many, but of course they're the upper minority of actors, directors, uh, producers, uh, fewer producers because our producers tend to be very uncivilized people. Uh, but quite a good, a good many actors, a good many directors, a good many costume or set designers or other technicians and writers uh, who think well of me. Uh, and uh, that's enough for me because those are the ones that I admire and those are the ones that I would like to be appreciated by. The rest I really don't care about. What should I look for in a good critique? Well, you should first of all see whether it's well written. If the thing as writing doesn't appeal to you as much as a good short story or a good play or a good uh, poem uh, or a good novel, uh, then already it's it's, it's not worth bothering. May I ask how long it takes you to write a review of, say, a play? Just an everyday play that well, you come home and sit at the typewriter. Uh, the, the kind of review that I do for New York, let's say, of a, an average play, if it's the first of, let's say, three reviews, the longest, somewhere about the writing might be three or four hours. Um, depends. Sometimes if it goes very well, it could be less. Sometimes if it doesn't go well, it could be another hour. Then the typing, since I'm a very poor typist, I do longhand, then I'm a very poor typist. I type very, very slowly with two fingers. And as I do that, I make corrections. 
And that, of course, takes a couple of hours at least. So that's... Probably. Almost a day's work. No, uh, usually a night's work, because I tend to do it, I tend to start late in the evening and then sit up till about one or two o'clock, and that's how it usually works. And as you know, artists always say, that critic, he can't do, so he writes. I mean, he can't get up here and act. Well, that's where they're wrong, because it is, criticism is an art of a different kind, just as writing poetry is an art of a different kind, and, uh, and painting is an art of a different kind, um, but criticism is an art unto itself. And it's not the same as acting, it's not the same as directing, it's not the same as writing plays, okay, or movies. The, then the next thing you look for is, is whether the critic in question can explain his position to you, because opinions are cheap, but the documenting and supporting and making convincing of opinions, that is where it is. In other words, the the teacherly aspect of the critique, whether the critic can really teach you something, show you why this is bad, why this is good, why this is fairly good but maybe could have been better, and so on, and give reasons, and give the appropriate quotations, and give the appropriate arguments. Uh, that would be the second thing. Uh, the third thing would be whether it gives you enough of a total picture of the thing, because if a critic is very good on acting, let's say, but doesn't tell you much about other aspects of the film or the play, then that's not enough. So it, those would be the, the, the immediate things to look for. Then there might be other things, but those are less. Just out of curiosity, do you prefer reviewing, critiquing movies or theater? Oh, I like both equally much. Let me add one thing. Also, I think a historical perspective is important. If the, if the reviewer approaches the thing as if this were the only musical that ever was and loves it, that's much less interesting than if he places it in a historic perspective and says this is how this fits in with what has been or with what has not yet been. Let's talk about what has been and where we are now in terms of the, of the arts. Yeah. How do you see us today in 1981? Well, it's not a great moment for either movies or plays or indeed for a lot of other arts because there is a sense of tiredness, there's a sense of exhaustion, there's a sense of déjà vu in the arts. Almost, almost everything we see today, we either feel it's been done already or we feel it's so far out, it's so weird, it's so totally off the wall that it, it has no meaning for me unless I happen to be a phony and think that something new is wonderful just because it's new and different. In point of fact, it's not wonderful. If something, if you paint, uh, if you paint a horse uh, chartreuse, it's new and different, but what do you gain by that? Andy Warhol, for example. Well, Andy Warhol, for example, exactly. I mean, but Andy Warhol I mean, what is, do you think of him? Nothing, nothing, which <laughs> may be too much because in point of fact, he may be less than nothing. But in any case, uh, uh, so novelty for its own sake has nothing to do with art or merit or survival. So that you have these two things, these weird new things that are meaningless and these tired old things that are repetitions of things that have been. It's very hard to find an original voice either in the theater or even in film which doesn't have as much of a backlog. You think it's that blockbuster mentality that seems to be loose that you've got to have the hundred million dollar movie? That's bad but that is an economic problem but of course economics do have a lot to do with the situation. Yes if things are very expensive then obviously they have to be huge successes. In a period in which things cost less one can take chances, one can experiment, one can appreciate partial success, which is very hard to, to achieve today, especially in film, where, where the costs are even much bigger than in the theater. Uh, it would be nice, for example, if we had a much more subsidized theater. I think we need a national theater. Uh, we need uh, bigger rather than smaller subsidies, as the present administration seems to think. Why do you suppose, as a society, we're so reluctant to pay for the arts on a broad thing. I mean, we really do seem to want only the big winners. Don't we? Well, I guess we're not very cultured. I think it does make a difference whether we are a society that really started cracking, let's say, in the, in the 17th and 18th centuries, or whether we've been at it for, say, 2,000 or 3,000 years. In that sense, the Japanese, uh, the Europeans um, have it all over us. And ultimately, it does make a difference. I mean, obviously, individual brilliance, uh, a certain elite uh, excellence exists in every country. But then, when you go below that, 
In other countries, it doesn't thin out quite so quickly. It doesn't disappear quite so quickly. There is a more of a pyramid. Whereas here we have a kind of apex, and then suddenly there's nothing. And where's the rest of the pyramid? There's only sand. I guess my last thought is feeling as you do and striking out as you do. I guess I wonder, why do you keep going to the theater? Well, because I love it, which is hard for people to understand. They think that love means approving everything, uh, swallowing everything. I think that is not love. That's either masochism or imbecility, but it's not love. Uh, or else it's a, it's a terrible bad habit of which people can't let go. In my case, I go because I have hope. Uh, no matter how hard hit I am by each absurdity I have to witness, I still, well, I try to see what good there is, and, and usually there is something good. I mean, there's a good performance, there's a good photography, there's good direction, even if the rest isn't good, and that's something especially since I don't have to pay for it. Uh, if I had to pay um, $50 for merely good direction, I might be put out uh, or put off. But as it is, I can at least endure because of something. And then there's hope. There is hope because every once in a while, a wonderful play comes around. Uh, well, wait, wait a minute. What about the blockbuster for the so-called blockbusters we've got? Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think that's garbage. I mean, it's foolishness. It's, it's boring. I'm after five minutes, you're so saturated with with climaxes, that, that they turn into anticlimaxes immediately. So by the time the sixth minute of that film is on, you've already been through 20 climaxes, and, it, and you, 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 you OD on climaxes. That's not movie making as I see it. But obviously, you don't agree with the public. No, no, no. But look, I mean, the public uh, has never been very good about uh, calling shots. The great masterpieces in any art form have almost never been immediate public favorites. It takes the public a good 20 to 30 years or 50 years or 100 years in the theater sometimes to come around. It's all right. A masterpiece can wait. It's only reviewers who think in this immediate mentality, if it's not a success now. A critic says, well, maybe this thing is ahead of its time. Maybe this thing will take another 10 years to, to really make it. But in the end, it will. Mr. Simon, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.